You'll notice there in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, speaking about Jesus, it says, Having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And we already have our first amen. He's able to save. He is able to save all who obey Him. So last week we looked at the Old Testament verse that is quoted more in the New Testament verse than any other verse. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. And it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 24 times. It's either a direct quote in the New Testament or an allusion to it. Had someone come up to me after church last week. Do you think that's God's favorite verse? I thought that's an interesting way to look at it since it's quoted so frequently. Well, today we're going to explore the truth that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And we're going to look at the verse in the Old Testament that is quoted the second most often in the New Testament. And that's Psalm 110, verse 4. And this verse today says, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That Jesus is our great high priest is revealed not only in Psalm 110, but it's developed at length in the New Testament book that we know as the book of Hebrews. It's really kind of fascinating. Chapters 5 through 10 focus heavily upon Psalm 110 in Hebrews. We have an inspired commentary on this particular psalm and this particular verse. And so we're going to spend a lot of time in Hebrews today looking at that particular truth. Um, and the other thing I should mention, in the, in, the, in the book of Hebrews, the two roles are clearly combined, that he is the king and that he is the priest. They are put together in harmony. And as we get to chapter 10 later today, we'll see that there's a contrast to the Old Testament priest who went daily to make sacrifices on behalf of the people. And there's no better way to describe it than it was a bloody mess. Gallons and gallons and gallons of blood were shed every day. They did that every day as the priest, and the great high priest would go we annually into the holiest of holies. But Jesus Christ, our great high priest, suffered and died once for all, and shed his blood, and it is done. And there's a clear contrast to that. And then he sat down at the right hand of God the Father, till all of his enemies have become his footstool, and he will reign forevermore. Now that's the theological, that's the contextual, that's a historical setting for what we're going to look at. Let me move it to a little bit more personal thought. We desperately need a mediator between us and holy God. If you've ever had a relationship that's gone sideways and tried to restore it, you know it can be very difficult at times. And there are times when you might call for someone to say, would you please sit with us and help us try and work on this relationship where we can be restored? And that's a good thing to do. But that is nothing compared to what is necessary for us to be in the presence of holy God. We need a mediator. There's not a single one of us in our current estate who could be in the presence of God right now. We would be consumed by His glory, by His holiness. You look at the Old Testament, you think about Abraham. He was hidden, I mean Moses. Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock and only allowed to see the backside of God because it was just too much. And praise be to God that there is the man, Jesus Christ, the God-man, whom the Bible says He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul goes on to explain that having been justified by faith, and here it comes, it's really sweet, we have peace with God. We're allowed to draw near and to be in His presence forevermore. And today we're going to explore this as we look at Psalm 110, verses 4-7. through 7. He is our great high priest and spent a lot of time in the book of Hebrews. If you would please stand with me, I'd like to read today from Psalm 110, the entire psalm. And again, we see in this passage two verses that are quoted most often in the New Testament, the first verse and the fourth verse. The Lord Jehovah God the Father has said to my Lord Adonai Jesus, God the Father has said to Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn, that is Jehovah, and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And Adonai, Jesus Christ, is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. I'd like to ask if um, Mitchell Herbert would please pray at this time as we look at God's Word.
Dear Heavenly Father and Holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as a body of believers to worship you and praise you. Pray that as we prepare to hear your word, that you would give Pastor Steve the words to speak. You would give us ears to listen and a heart to understand. That we would leave this place um, better prepared to follow you and to uh, live out your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So thank you. You may be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And in this particular verse, there are three phrases that require study, but also require comment. The first phrase being, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. This is a reminder to us that the decision is unchangeable. The decision is unchangeable. God has determined, He has made a purpose, and He will not change, He will not relent. And this touches on the very character of God. God is a God who cannot change. He is the unchangeable, eternal God. When you think about God, sometimes people comment and say, there is nothing that's impossible with God. But again, as was mentioned today, we have to understand that in context. What does that mean? Because indeed, there are certain things God cannot do because He's an unchangeable God. For instance, God cannot sin. For instance, God cannot deny Himself. He cannot be less than God. He cannot be anything other than the one true God who is faithful. And He cannot swear by anyone higher. So when God makes a commitment, when God makes a promise, He swears by Himself, because there's no one higher than Him. Go to Hebrews chapter 6 already. Hebrews chapter 6. And now we're going to spend a lot of time in Hebrews. Beginning there in chapter 6, I want you to see this in the passage itself. Hebrews chapter 6, and down at verse 13. And here speaking about the relationship with Abraham, the Bible says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, notice, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Now this passage goes on to tell us there's also something that God cannot do. There's no one greater, so he can't swear by anyone higher. No one greater. Go down to verse 17. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it with an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. We have an unchangeable God who has made an unchangeable declaration. He has sworn by himself. He cannot relent. He cannot change. And this promise relates to Jesus Christ, namely saying to him, you are a priest forever. This again is not just unchangeable. This is eternal. God Himself has spoken. He has ordained that the Son be our great high priest. If you study the Old Testament, if you want to study about the priest, you go to Exodus chapters 28, 29, and 30. We're told there that the priest would mediate between God and man. There has to be someone between holy God and sinful man. The Bible tells us that daily, daily, they would offer sacrifices to allow the people to draw near to come close to God. However, there was a limitation. This was simply a temporal opportunity for them to draw near in worship. Now, on the Day of Atonement, something else took place. On that particular day, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, behind the veil. But if you study it, you'll find out that before that high priest went in there, just one time, there were all these washings that had to be performed, all these sacrifices that had to take place, and they had to have the ability to drag him back out in case he wasn't properly prepared and died in that place. This, behind this veil then, there would be this offering, the Day of Atonement. There was two goats selected. The first one was sacrifice. The blood was shed. The second one was the scapegoat. And symbolically, imagine the sins of the people being placed on that scapegoat and that scapegoat being removed from the camp, sent out. So as to signify, to symbol, that our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. But again, all of this work was just temporal. It was a picture of things to come. And it could not save. If the blood of bulls and goats could have saved, then Jesus did not need to die. But no matter how many they sacrificed, day in and day out, annually, no matter what, it could not save. But not only that, these priests who served faithfully, and could you imagine, what are you going to do today? I'm going to sacrifice animals. What are you going to do after lunch? I'm going to sacrifice animals. What are you going to do next day? I'm going to sacrifice animals. What are you going to do? I'm going to sacrifice. This is what they did day in and day out. And the Bible says that they were prevented, though, by death. They could not continue on this necessity. They were prevented by death. But Jesus Christ is different. He is according to the order of Melchizedek. He's not of the Levitical order. He's not of the Aaronic priesthood, but rather he's the, the order of Melchizedek. For this, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 1, 2, and 3. But before you look at it, before you read it, 
This draws as its reference from Genesis chapter 14. There's this guy in the Old Testament known as Melchizedek. How many of you have heard that name before? A very interesting character, isn't it? Do you remember some things about him? First and foremost, keep this in mind. He appeared to Abraham before the law was given. Some 400 years. Why is that important? Because before the law was given that talked about the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, here we have this high priest known as Melchizedek who's going to receive offerings on behalf of the God Most High. The second thing you'll keep in mind, and you'll see it in the passage, is this. He had no origin, no father or mother was mentioned. He shows up out of nowhere. Nothing is said about his demise. He's just there on the scene. And we also know that he was the king of righteousness. Not just a good guy, the king of righteousness. And here's something really sweet. Tied to his title, the king of Salem, he was the king of peace. So in his capacity, restoring and granting peace. Now, look what the writer of Hebrews says about this guy in chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor of end of days, and notice this phrase, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, the writer of Hebrews devotes almost half of this letter to speak about this great high priest, Jesus Christ, after the order of Melchizedek. And he says, we've got so many things to say, but you're dull of hearing. We can't go on. It's just too much. You can't handle all of it. And indeed, there is much more that needs to be said about our great high priest, and we will spend eternity exploring who he is and getting to know him. But let me mention a few things from the book of Hebrews kind of rapidly. There are two words in Scripture that you know I love. They are, but God. And those are grand and those are glorious. But there are two words in Scripture that are extremely refreshing and pleasing and soothing to the soul. And those two words are, for us. For us. And if you ever read or study the book of Hebrews, and someone was doing that, told me last night, that's what they're doing right now, plans on doing it for the next four or five years, and I thought, that is great. Look up every Old Testament reference and just enjoy it and delight in it. But if you read through it, you study it, look over and over again for the words, for us. Jesus, what He did was for us. Jesus was obedient for us. Jesus was obedient to the point of death for us. Isn't that sweet and delightful to know? And He was alone, the perfect sinless sacrifice. There is no one like Him. Never will be anyone like Him. And again, all these references, you can look in your bulletin, you'll find that one's from Hebrews 7 and 10. And in so doing, remember that place, the Holy of Holies, where the, great, the high priest would go annually? What happened to that veil when Jesus died? Torn in two. Why? To represent, to teach us that now we have, can gain access to the Holy of Holies, to God Himself. We no longer need all of these priests to sacrifice all these animals. Christ Himself has done it once for all, and He bids us come. Draw near. Know me. Delight in me. And that means the temple system was made obsolete. If they went the next day to sacrifice, someone should have said, you don't need to do it. It's been done. Christ, the Lamb of God, has died, and it is finished. And after He did this, He ascended on high, sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And the Bible tells us over and over again, He did it once. Once for all. It is done. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's see this in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. The writer says, For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself and now to appear, look at this, in the presence of God, what? For us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it's appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. This is sweet. 
This is good. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who is also the king, he is triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, and every enemy will be subdued. Go back again to Psalm 110 and look at those final verses there, verses 5 through 7. Speaking about Jesus, Adonai, Jehovah said to my Adonai, the Father has said to the Son, in verse 5, And the Son, the Lord, is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of His wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink the brook by the wayside. Therefore, He shall lift up the head. Now, I know I'm reading this and I'm immediately immediately gripped with the fact that there is coming a day that God's wrath will be put on display for all eternity. And I, I can't help but stop for just a moment and remind us that we have got to be a people of prayer because God is the God of salvation. And those who do not trust in Him, they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. It is declared, it is written, it is certain. And I would call upon you to have the compassion of Christ, the sensitivity that He would give us with His Spirit, that we would pray for the lost and never give up hope, and as we have opportunity to seek to witness to them, because He is the God who alone can save. And this passage reminds us, yes, that every nation, every enemy will be subdued by the King, our great High Priest. Christ will be lifted up. Enemies will be judged. God will exalt Jesus Christ because our great High Priest, Jesus Christ, has an unchangeable appointment, an eternal role. He alone is qualified to be our great High Priest. Again, unchangeable, eternal. He's unique. He's the King of kings and He's our great High Priest who has passed through the heavens. And we should affirm this In this we should rejoice, and we must fall and worship Christ the King. Can I get an amen? So now let's move um, to where the rubber meets the road. We we know this is true. We see it in Scripture. We we proclaim it. But what about the between time? What about the now? Not so much about eternity, but what about now in the time in which we live? between the work of the cross and the culmination of history. And let's just talk about where we really are. When we see the prices of things going up drastically, not just gas, which we value as a people, we're not yet green enough, are we? But also food. That is, and, and we're in a time right now where people are making decisions, and unfortunately a lot of the decisions are being made. I'll just run up the credit card. It's not a big deal. I have a lot of debt. But that's going to come to an end. And what are people going to do when now they really do have to make tough decisions? Not whether or not they buy the next vehicle, not whether or not they go on that trip, but whether or not they give up this meal or that meal during the course of a week. Or or what about if we have to make decisions like we just can't afford to live on our own? Someone's got to sell their home and we got to move in with one another. And, And that's before I talk, what if, what if God's purpose for us is to completely be brought down as a nation and humbled? What are we going to do then? Will we still trust Him as our great high priest and the ruling king? Or will we turn from Him? What about when we live in a time, and I think probably everyone who's lived for any amount of years, you know this is true, there are are relationships that sadly come to an end. And, and, And that's before I talk about the passing of loved ones. I mean, we live in a world where things are severed, where things are segmented, where things come to an end. We also live in a, in a day when we can say, praise the Lord, His mercies are brand new every morning, but as you get older, you also find every day, so are the daily aches and pains. They're brand new every morning. And one of the things that probably is the deepest pain is for parents who see their children often living in rebellious ways, who saw their children have a good start, made professions of faith, seemed like they were on track. And then suddenly, it's not just that they've rebelled against you as parents, but they've rebelled against God. Again, I remind you to have hope, take comfort, be in prayer. God is still an all-powerful God, but it's hard, isn't it? And that add to that, as you get older, sometimes you're just tired. <laughs> you, you, but it's 8 o'clock in the morning, I know, but I'm tired. I need to take a nap. I'm just tired. And you can't think clearly, and you say, but I've already had long COVID, so it's not that, I'm just getting older. And let's just be honest that the, the to-do list is almost always longer than the day. Let's talk about our great high priest, and let me make three statements 
that should move us in praise, but also comfort our hearts. Number one, Jesus Christ, our great high priest, has completely restored us to God. He has completely restored us to God. If you want to think of it another way, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We cannot be severed. We cannot be segmented. He has completely restored us. Any system that teaches that Jesus is not sufficient is not biblical. Any system that teaches that Jesus is not sufficient is not biblical, and that can be done two different ways. Number one, a system that teaches you that Christ must be crucified over and over and over again, either in some mystical sense or in some liturgical sense, is not biblical. And any system that teaches that you must add to the work of Christ to either be saved or to maintain salvation, maintain salvation is not biblical. Jesus Christ and Christ alone, He is sufficient. And He has brought us and restored us completely to God. This is why we speak about resting in the Lord. Resting in the Lord and what He has done. Indeed, we talk about this also in the passing of loved ones. That they are now at home resting in the Lord. And as I mentioned before, on those occasions, we as believers, when there's the passing of a loved one who died in the Lord, we can mourn and at the same time rejoice. We weep with those because of the pain that they're experiencing in their loss. But we rejoice because the loved one has entered into his rest, now eternally. And I'm reminded that someone I think said yesterday during one of the services, that individual, there's no sadness now in the presence of God. We're the ones who have sadness for our loss. But they have entered into their rest. We're not talking about being idle here. We're not talking about doing nothing. We're talking about resting from our labor, of trying to be good enough that God would say to us, well done and good faithful servant. The work is done by Christ and by Christ alone, and we rest in Him what He has done. Again, Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go there to Hebrews chapter 10. A wonderful commentary on all of this truth that we see in Psalm 110. This is Hebrews chapter 10, and we're down at verse 11 now. Hebrews 10 and verse 11. And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering sacrifices, the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Christ Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Do you see the eternal and the temporal there? You are perfected forever, and yet you are being sanctified. But the work is completed. We're just in process. And one day we'll see Him face to face. Verse 15, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after He had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their mind I will write them. Then He adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. As far as the east is from the west, he will remember them no more. Now look at 18. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. It's done. No more sacrifices need to be made. His work results in us being received by the Father, and we are perfect in His sight. And at currently that means His righteous law is encoded on our hearts and He remembers our sins no more. No more. In chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews quoted the same passage and also reminded us that in Christ, we have no need that anyone should teach us in order to know the Lord, for He Himself will teach us that we might know Him. Now, this is not talking about discipleship. Praise be God for those who are diligent in their study of God's Word and help us to understand it. This is talking about initial salvation itself. God teaches us. He calls us individually. He says, let me teach you something important. You belong to me. You're one of my children. And we cry out for the first time, Abba, Father. We have no need that anyone else would do this because Christ has done it for us. And His Spirit renews us and He saves us. And with that, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. For me, maybe you can relate to this. I think what takes the greatest toll on me is when relationships are strained. 
and when there's a lack of peace. I was trying to think last night on the fly. I think, there was, I think there's been two, maybe three times over the last three decades when my wife and I were not in a good place on a Sunday morning. Those were the most miserable Sunday mornings ever. So you say, but what about that Sunday when your pants fell apart in the pulpit and they ripped from seam to seam? Wasn't that pretty? No, that was nothing compared to not being right in relationship and trying to teach God's Word. And if you're like me, you know what that means. It just seems like a crushing weight when we're not right in relationship. They're just sleepless nights. That's one thing for us to not be right with one another. I cannot imagine what it would be right, like right now to not be right with God. For those who have tasted of salvation, could you imagine what it would be like to be returning to being an enemy of God and having that with all that you know, and now for God to look upon you and say, no. I can't even imagine that. I, for me, just when I sin and it takes me too long to repent, that's bad enough. Now, as it relates to human relationships, we have to strive to do the best that we can do to be at peace as much as it depends upon us. But let me remind you, in the end, God will bring everything back around and every relationship will be restored and we will worship the King of Kings forever together and we'll be at peace with one another. What He has begun, He will complete. And that includes that Jesus Christ continually brings us near to God. Jesus Christ com- continues faithfully to bring us near to God. Eternal life is to know God. And forever we'll spend eternity getting to know God. We as finite beings, even in His presence, even in glorified estates, we will know Him truly, but we'll never know Him fully. And just as soon as you feel like you track Him down and you get to know Him, you're like, now I know God. It's like, No, I don't. And off you go again, because He is infinite. And yet what Christ does is He continues to bring us near to God in this eternal pursuit. Go to Hebrews chapter 6 now. Hebrews chapter 6. This is another passage. I don't know if we'll get far enough in it, Hebrews 6 at this time. This is another passage which speaks about this being done for us. I think we'll just look at a couple of verses now. No, we'll get to it. Some for us passages. Good. We've already looked at this. Remember in verse 18, two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that's set before us. Now these new verses here, 19 and 20. This hope, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. He's the forerunner who's gone there for us. For the forerunner has entered for us even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I want you to think for just a moment about who you would consider to be the person who's closest to you, who you love the best, who loves you the best. I hope everybody can get someone in their mind right now. Imagine that for whatever reason, there's a season that you've been separated. You've been distanced. Maybe it's been months, maybe it's been a couple years, but it's been a long time and you've really missed them. And some of you are now even thinking about eternity. And if that's where your thoughts go, then imagine that day when you get home to glory and you see them again, and this is after you've, of course, worshipped God for at least 10,000 years, right? But after you you see that loved one again, do you think you're going to go up to them and say, so, how you doing? (laughs) How's it going? Back at you. Could you imagine the embrace? Could you imagine running into their arms? and not wanting to let go? Isn't that going to be sweet? I, right now, I'm delighting our, in our grandsons. You saw two of them today up here. There is such a blessing when they come over to our house, or like this morning, and they run to me and say, Pa, and they want me to hold them. But I'll tell you what's even sweeter than that, when they don't let go. <laughs> when it's like, I got no, no, i got to go do something else. They're like, no, Pa, no, Pa. And think about that, the parable of the prodigal. Think about the father who waited day in and day out. And the passage says that when he saw the son returning, what did he do? Ran to him and embraced him. This is what God does for us. He draws us near, and I don't know a better way to say it than what someone said to me recently. He hugs us up tight. He hugs us up close, so near, so dear. And let me remind you that the blessing that we have in Christ Jesus is that He intercedes eternally for us. This to me is beyond my pay grade. That means when I get home to heaven, Jesus Christ is still interceding for me. 
which teaches me that God must be so holy that I need a forever eternal mediator to intercede for me. Both uh, Hebrews and Romans remind us that Jesus does in fact intercede for us, but in both cases, they remind us that Jesus does more than represent us. The term indicates that He pleads for us. The idea is a courtroom setting, but don't think for a moment that Jesus, while you're in the courtroom being charged and you have to confess, yes, I am guilty, I am worthy of eternal damnation, Jesus Christ doesn't just simply come to our side and say, I know it's kind of tough, and I'm just going to sit here with you now. I think I'll just hang out with you, and we'll sit in the ashes. Jesus Christ says, no, I am not only going to represent you, I am going to plead your case. And I'm going to say, yes, indeed, this one is guilty, but I died for this one. And in the name of His own blood, there is forgiveness. And we are allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. He's not merely an advocate. He is compassionate, and He is passionate. He did it for us. He was obedient for us. He was obedient to the point of death for us. He rose from the dead for us that we might be justified. He's ascended on high for us, and He's coming again for us. And forevermore will intercede, mediate on our behalf. If someone comes up to you and they look at your countenance and they say, are you hurting and are you broken within? And you can say, yes, I am. But Jesus knows and He cares and He takes care of me. If someone were to see you and say, you look like you're in pain and you're discouraged, you can say, yes, but Jesus knows and He cares and He acts on my behalf. If someone sees you and says, you look really confused and overwhelmed, you can say, yes, I am. But Jesus knows and He cares and He mediates for me. Are you afraid and uncertain? He still cares. He still knows. Are you suffering? He knows you better than you know yourself. And He meets your every need. In this life, He pleads for us. In the life to come, He still mediates. And as Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy, he stated there is but one mediator between God and men, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Again, in Hebrews now, chapter 7, go to verse 20. Hebrews 7 and verse 20. Picking it up again, speaking about Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And inasmuch as he was made a priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, for you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. So in light of the fact of what He does, our great High Priest, He restores us to God, He brings us near to God, He intercedes for us eternally. What must we do? It's interesting. We would seem like these are in opposition to one another. He draws us near, and yet we are still told to draw near. He bids us come, and yet we must come. And we must be a people prepared for His presence. We are commanded indeed to draw near, and I want you to see that as well, Hebrews chapter 10. Go there with me, please, Hebrews chapter 10, to a passage that you'll recognize rather rapidly. Hebrews chapter 10, down at verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, this is verse 19, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast our confession confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching the day of His return approaching. How sweet it is to know that we are commanded to hold on. 
but to know the truth that He ultimately holds on to us. He's got us firmly in the grip of His hand. He's got us surrounded from behind and before, and He will take care of us. And He is the one who will appear a second time, a second time not to pay for sins, but to receive us unto Himself for all eternity. So with that, again from the book of Hebrews, our journey here below might be difficult, but we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. There are others who have gone before us, and therefore we are told to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and run with endurance the race that He has set before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on Christ Jesus, the prize. He is the one. We look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God the Father. And I don't, I'm not ashamed to say, for us. And I pray that we would be a people who are able to say with the writer of Hebrews, but we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Father, thank You. Thank You for doing so much more than caring. Thank You for sending Your Son to die in our place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.